Chapter thirty two of Essays and Dialogues. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Eric Metzler, Albuquerque, New Mexico. Essays and Dialogues by Giacomo Leopardi. Translated by Charles Eduardus. Chapter thirty two. Comparison of the last words of Marcus Brutus and Theophrastus. I think, in all ancient history, there can be found no words more lamentable and terrifying, yet withal, speaking humanly, more true than those uttered by Marcus Brutus shortly before death, in disparagement of virtue. This is what, according to Dionysius Cassius, he is reported to have said. O oh, miserable virtue, thou art but a mere phrase, and I have followed thee as thou thou wert a reality. Fate is stronger than thee. Plutarch, in his life of Brutus, makes no mention of this, which has induced Pierre Vettori to conclude that Cassius has here taken license in prose, often accorded to poetry. But its truth is confirmed by the witness of Florus, who states that Brutus, when at the point of death, exclaimed that virtue was an expression, and not a reality. Many people are shocked at those words of Brutus, and blame him for uttering them. They infer from their meaning, either that virtue is a sealed book to them, or else that they have never experienced ill fortune. The former inference alone is credible. In any case, it is certain they but slightly understand and still less realize the unhappiness of human affairs, or else they stupidly wonder why the doctrines of Christianity were not in force before the time of Christ. Other people interpret these words as demonstrating that Brutus was not, after all, the noble and pious man he was supposed to have been. They imagine that just before death he threw off the mask. But they are wrong. And if they give Brutus credit for sincerity in uttering these words in repudiation of virtue, let them consider how it were possible for him to disassociate himself from that with which he never had any association. If they think he was insincere, and spoke designedly and with ostentation, let them explain what object he could have in speaking vain and fallacious words, and immediately afterwards acting in accordance with them. Are facts deniable, simply because they are not in harmony with words? Brutus was a man overwhelmed by a great and unavoidable catastrophe. He was disheartened, and wearied with life and fortune, and having abandoned all desires and hopes, the deceitfulness of which he had experienced, he determined to take his destiny into his own hands and to put an end to his unhappiness. Why should he, at the very moment of eternal separation from his fellows, trouble to hunt the phantom of glory, and study to give forth words and thoughts to deceive those around him, and to gain human esteem, when he was about to leave humanity forever? What was it to him that he might gain a reputation on that earth which appeared so hateful and contemptible to him? These words of Brutus are well known to most of us, the following utterance of Theophrastus at the point of death is, I believe, less known, though very worthy of consideration. It forms a parallel with that of Brutus, both as to its substance and time of delivery. Diogenes Laertius mentions it, not, in my opinion, as original to himself, but as an extract from some more ancient and important work. He says that Theophrastus, just before death, being asked by his disciples whether he would leave them any token or words of advice, replied, None, except that man despises and rejects many pleasures for the sake of glory. But no sooner does he begin to live than death overtakes him. Hence the love of glory is as fatal a thing as possible. Strive to live happily. Abandon studies which are a weariness or cultivate them only so that they may bring you fame. Life is more vain than useful. As for me, I have no time to think more about it. You must study what is most expedient. So saying, 
he died. Other sayings of Theophrastus on this occasion are mentioned by Cicero and St. Jerome. These are better known, but have nothing to do with our subject. It would seem that Theophrastus lived to the age of more than a hundred, having devoted all his lifetime to study and writing, and having been an unwearied pursuer of glory. Suidas says that his death was due to the excess of his studies, and that he died surrounded by about two thousand of his disciples and followers, reverenced for his wisdom throughout the whole of Greece, regretting his pursuit of glory, just as Brutus repented of virtue. These two words, glory and virtue, were by the ancients regarded as almost synonymous in meaning, though it is not so in the present day. Theophrastus did not indeed say that glory is more frequently a matter of fortune than merit, which is oftener true now than in former times, but had he said so, there would have been no difference between his idea and that of Brutus. Such abjurations, or rather apostasies, of those noble errors which beautify, nay compose our very life, are of daily occurrence. They are due to the fact that the human intelligence in process of time discovers not only the nakedness, but even the skeleton of things. Wisdom also, which was regarded by the ancients as the consolation and chief cure for our unhappiness, has been obliged to impeach our condition, and almost requires a consolation for itself, since had not men followed it, they would not have known the greatness of their misfortune, or at least would have been able to remedy it with hope. But the ancients used to believe, according to the teaching of nature, that things were things, and not appearances, and that human life was destined to partake of happiness as well as unhappiness. Consequently, such apostasies as these were very rare, and were the result not of passions and vices, but of a sentiment and realization of the truth of things. Therefore they deserve careful and philosophical consideration. The words of Theophrastus are the more surprising when we think of the circumstances in which he died. He was prosperous and successful, and it would seem as though he could not have a single cause for regret. His chief aim, glory, he had succeeded in acquiring long ago. The utterance of Brutus, on the other hand, was one of those inspirations of misfortune which sometimes open out a new world to our minds, and persuade us of truths that require a long time for the mere intelligence to discover. Misfortune may indeed be compared in its effect to the frenzy of lyric poets, who at a glance as if situated in a lofty place, taken as much of the domain of human knowledge as requires many centuries before it be discerned by philosophers. In almost all ancient writings, whether philosophical, poetical, historical, or aught else, we meet with many very sorrowful expressions, common enough to us nowadays, but strange to the people of those times. These sentences, however, were mostly due to the innate or accidental misfortune of the writer, or the persons who spoke them, whether imaginary or real. And rarely we find on the monuments of the ancients any expression of the sadness or ennui which they felt because of the unreality of happiness, or their misfortunes, whether natural or due to force of circumstances. For when they suffered, they lamented their sufferings as the only hindrance to their happiness, which they not only considered it possible to obtain, but even man's right, although fate proved sometimes too strong. Now let us seek what could have placed in the mind of Theophrastus the sentiment about the vanity of glory and life, which considering his epoch and nation, is an extraordinary one. In the first place, we find that the studies of this philosopher were not limited to one or two branches of science. The record of his writings, which are mostly lost, inform us that his knowledge included little less than everything then knowable. And this universal science was not like that of Plato, subordinated to his imagination, but conformed to the teaching of Aristotle in being the result of experience and reason. Its aim, too, was not the discovery of the beautiful, 
but that which is its especial contrary, the useful. This being so, it is not wonderful that Theophrastus should attain to the height of human wisdom, that is, a knowledge of the vanity of life, and wisdom itself. For it is a fact that the numerous discoveries made recently by philosophers about the nature of men and things are chiefly the result of a comparison and synthesis of the different sciences and studies, whereby the mutual connection between the most distant parts of nature is demonstrated. Besides, from his book of Characters, we learn how clearly Theophrastus discerned the qualities and manners of men. Indeed, with the exception of the poets, very few ancient writers equal him in this respect. And this faculty is the sure sign of a mind capable of numerous, diverse, and powerful sensations. For, to produce a keen representation of the moral qualities and passions of men, the writer relies less on what actual facts he may have collected, or observations made, about the manners of others, than on his own mind, even though his personal habits be very different from those of his subjects. Massillon was asked one day what enabled him to describe so naturally the habits and feelings of men who, like himself, lived more in solitude than society. He replied, I contemplate myself. Dramatists and other poets do the same thing. Now a many-sided mind, subtle in discernment, cannot but feel the nakedness and absolute unhappiness of life. It acquires a tendency to sadness after meditation excited by numerous studies, especially such as are concerned with the very essence of things, like the speculative sciences. It is certain that Theophrastus, who loved study and glory above everything, and was master or rather founder of a very numerous school, knew and formally announced the uselessness of human exertions, including his own teaching and that of others. The little affinity existing between virtue and happiness of life, and the superior power of fortune to merit in the acquirement of happiness, especially among the wise and others. In this respect, perhaps, he was superior to all the Greek philosophers, especially those preceding Epicurus, from whom both in manners and thought he was essentially different. This is owing partly to circumstances already mentioned, and is also due to other things referred to by ancient writers on the subject of his teaching. It would seem as though his own fate had proved the truth of his doctrine. For he is not esteemed by modern philosophers as he ought to be, since all his mortal writings are lost, with the exception of his characters. His writings, too, on the subjects of politics and laws, and almost all those relating to metaphysics, are also missing. Besides, the ancient philosophers were little inclined to give him credit for keener perception than they possessed. On the contrary, many of them, especially such as were shallow and conceited, blamed and ill-treated him. These men taught that the wise man is essentially happy, and that virtue and wisdom suffice to procure happiness, although they were only too well aware of the contrary, even supposing they had any real knowledge of either the one or the other. Philosophers will never be cured of this idea. Even the philosophy of the present day teaches the same thing, whereas, correctly speaking, it can only say that everything beautiful delightful and great, is mere falsity and nothingness. But to return to Theophrastus, most of the ancients were incapable of the profound and sorrowful sentiment that inspired him. Theophrastus is roughly handled by all the philosophers in their writings and schools for having praised the saying of Callisthenes, Fortune, not wisdom, is the mistress of life. They consider that no philosopher ever gave expression to a weaker sentiment. So says Cicero, who in another place remarks that Theophrastus in his book about the happy life attributed much influence to fortune, which he considered a most important factor of happiness. Again, he adds, let us make much use of Theophrastus, but give virtue more reality and value than he gave to it. 
Perhaps it may be imagined from these remarks that Theophrastus had little sympathy with the weaknesses of human nature, and that he waged war against their influence in public and private life, both by his writings and actions. It might also be thought that he would restrict the empire of the imagination in favor of that of reason. As a matter of fact, he did just the contrary. Concerning his actions, we read in Plutarch's book against Colotes that our philosopher twice freed his country from a tyranny. As for his teachings, Cicero says that Theophrastus, in a writing on the subject of wealth, dilated at considerable length on the advantages of magnificence and pomp at the shows and national festivals. Indeed, he considered the chief usefulness of riches to lie in the consequent power of expenditure that accompanied them. This idea is blamed and ridiculed by Cicero, with whom, however, I will not discuss the question, for his superficial knowledge of philosophy might have easily led him to a wrong conclusion. I imagine Cicero to have been a man rich in civil and domestic virtues, but ignorant of the greatest stimulants and bulwarks of virtue that the world possesses, namely those things that are peculiarly adapted to excite and arouse the mind, and exercise the powers of the imagination. I will merely say that those men among the ancients and moderns who knew best and realized most strongly and deeply the nullity of everything, and the force of truth, have not only refrained from endeavoring to lead others to their condition, but have even labored hard to conceal and disguise it from themselves. They acted like men who had learned from experience the wretchedness that resulted from that wisdom and knowledge. Many celebrated examples of this are furnished, especially in recent times. Truly, if our philosophers fully understood what they endeavor to teach, and realized in their own persons the consequences of their philosophy, instead of welcoming their knowledge, they would hate and abhor it. They would strive to forget what they know, and to shut their eyes to that which they see. They would take refuge as their best resource in those sweet unrealities which nature herself has placed in all our minds, nor would they think it well to enforce on others the doctrine of the nothingness of all things. If, however, desire of glory should incite them to do this last, they will admit that in this part of the universe we can only live by putting faith in things that are non-existent. There is another considerable difference between the circumstances of Theophrastus and Brutus, that of time. When Theophrastus lived, the influence of those fictions and phantoms which ruled the thoughts and actions of the ancients had not departed. The epoch of Brutus, on the other hand, may be termed the last age of the imagination. Knowledge and experience of the truth prevailed amongst the people. Had it not been so, Brutus need not have fled from life as he did, and the Roman Republic would not have died with him. And not only the Republic, but also the whole of antiquity, that is, the old customs and characteristics of the civilized world, were at the point of death, together with the opinions which gave birth to, and supported them. Life had already lost its value, and wise men sought to console themselves not so much for their fate as for existence itself, because they regarded it as incredible that man should be born essentially and solely for misery. Thus they arrived at the conception of another life, which might explain the reason of virtue and noble actions. Such explanation had hitherto been found in life itself, but was so no longer, nor was it ever again to be found there. To these ideas of futurity are due the noble sentiments often expressed by Cicero, especially in his oration for Archias. End of chapter 32 Recording by Eric Metzler, Albuquerque, United States of America Section 33 of Essays and Dialogues. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Essays and Dialogues by Giacomo Leopardi.
translated by Charles Edvardus. Section 33. Dialogue between Tristano and a friend. Friend. I have read your book. It is as melancholy as usual. Tristano. Yes, as usual. Friend. Melancholy, disconsolate, hopeless. It is clear that this life appears to you an abominable thing. Tristano. How can I excuse myself? I was then so firmly convinced of the truth of my notion about the unhappiness of life. Friend. Unhappy it may be, but even then, what good? Tristano. No, no, on the contrary, it is very happy. I have changed my opinion now. But when I wrote this book, I had that folly in my head, as I tell you, and I was so full of it that I should have expected anything rather than to doubt the truth of what I wrote on the subject. For I thought the conscience of every reader would assuredly bear witness to the truth of my statements. I imagined there might be differences of opinion as to the use or harm of my writings, but none as to their truth. I also believed that my lamentations, since they were aroused by misfortunes common to all, would be echoed in the heart of every one who heard them. And when I afterwards felt impelled to deny, not merely some particular observation, but the whole fabric of my book, and to say that life is not unhappy, and that if it seems so to me, it must have been the effect of illness or some other misfortune peculiar to myself. I was at first amazed, astonished, petrified, and for several days as though transported into another world. Then I began to think, and was a little irritated with myself. Finally I laughed, and said to myself that the human race possesses a characteristic common to husbands. For a married man who wishes to live a quiet life, relies on the fidelity of his wife, even when half the world knows she is faithless. Similarly, when a man takes up his abode in any country, he makes up his mind to regard it as one of the best countries in the world, and he does so. For the same reason, men, desiring to live, agree to consider life a delightful and valuable thing. They therefore believe it to be so, and are angry with whoever is of the contrary opinion. Hence it follows that in reality people always believe, not the truth, but what is, or appears to be best for them. The human race, which has believed and will continue to put faith in so many absurdities, will never acknowledge that it knows nothing, that it is nothing, and that it has nothing to hope. No philosopher teaching any one of these three things would be successful, nor would he have followers, and the populace especially would refuse to believe in him. For, apart from the fact that all three doctrines have little to recommend them to any one who wishes to live, the two first offend man's pride, and they all require courage and strength of mind in him who accepts them. Now men are cowards of ignoble and narrow minds, and always anticipating good, because always ready to vary their ideas of good according to the necessities of life. They are very willing, as Petrarch says, to surrender to fortune, very eager and determined to console themselves in any misfortune, and to accept any compensation in exchange for what is denied them, or for that which they have lost, and to accommodate themselves to any condition of life, however wicked and barbarous. When deprived of any desirable thing, they nourish themselves on illusions, from which they derived as much satisfaction as if their conceptions were the most genuine and real things in the world. As for me, I cannot refrain from laughing at the human race, enamored of life, just as the people in the south of Europe laugh at husbands enamored of faithless wives. I consider men show very little courage in thus allowing themselves to be deceived and deluded like fools. They are not only content to bear the greatest sufferings, 
but are also willing to be, as it were, puppets of nature and destiny. I here refer to the deceptions of the intellect, not the imagination. Whether these sentiments of mine are the result of illness, I do not know. But I do know that, well or ill, I despise men's cowardice. I reject every childish consolation and elusive comfort, and am courageous enough to bear the deprivation of every hope, to look steadily on the desert of life, to hide no part of our unhappiness, and to accept all the consequences of a philosophy, sorrowful but true. This philosophy, if of no other use, gives the courageous man the proud satisfaction of being able to rend asunder the cloak that conceals the hidden and mysterious cruelty of human destiny. This I said to myself, almost as though I were the inventor of this bitter philosophy, which I saw rejected by everyone as a new and unheard of thing. But on reflection, I found that it dated from the time of Solomon, Homer, and the most ancient poets and philosophers, who abound with fables and sayings which express the unhappiness of human life. One says that, quote, man is the most miserable of the animals, unquote. Another that, quote, it were better not to be born, or being born to die in the cradle, unquote. Again, quote, whom the gods love die young, unquote. besides numberless other similar sayings. And I also remembered that from then, even until now, all poets, philosophers, and writers, great and small, have in one way or another echoed and confirmed the same doctrines. Then I began to think again, and spent a long time in a state of wonder, contempt, and laughter. At length I turned to study the matter more deeply, and came to the conclusion that man's unhappiness is one of the innate errors of the mind, and that the refutation of this idea, through the demonstration of the happiness of life, is one of the greatest discoveries of the nineteenth century. Now therefore I am at peace, and confess I was wrong to hold the views I previously held. Friend, then have you changed your opinion? Tristano, of course. Do you imagine I should oppose the discoveries of the 19th century? Friend, do you believe all the century believes? Tristano, certainly, why not? Friend, you believe then in the infinite perfectibility of the human race, do you not? Tristano, undoubtedly. Friend, do you also believe that the human race actually progresses daily? Tristano, Assuredly, it is true that sometimes I think of one of the ancients was physically worth four of us, and the body is the man, because, apart from all else, high-mindedness, courage, the passions, capacity for action and enjoyment, and all that ennobles and vivifies life depend on the vigor of the body, without which they cannot exist. The weak man is not a man, but a child, and less than a child, because it is his fate to stand aside and see others live. All he can do is to chatter. Life is not for him. Hence, in olden times, and even in more enlightened ages, weakness of body was regarded as ignominious. But with us, it is very long since education dined to think of such a base and abject thing as the body. The mind is its sole care, yet in its endeavors to cultivate the mind, it destroys the body without perceiving that the former is also necessarily destroyed. And even if it were possible to remedy this false system of education, it would be impossible to discover without a radical change in the state of modern society, any cure for the other inconveniences of life, whether public or private. Everything that formerly tended to preserve and perfect the body seems today to be in conspiracy for its destruction. 
The consequence is that, compared with the ancients, we are little better than children, and they, in comparison with us, may indeed be termed perfect men. I refer equally to individuals, in comparison with individuals, as to the masses, to use this most expressive modern term, compared to the masses. I will add also that the superior vigor of the ancients is manifested in their moral and metaphysical systems, but I do not allow myself to be influenced by such trifling objections, and I firmly believe that the human race is perpetually in a state of progression. Friend, you believe also, if I rightly understand you, that knowledge, or as it is called enlightenment, continually increases. Tristano, assuredly, although I observe that the desire of knowledge grows in proportion as the appreciation for study diminishes, and astonishing to say, if you count up the number of truly learned men who lived contemporaneously a 150 years ago, or even later, you will find them incomparably more numerous than at present. It may perhaps be said that learned people are rare nowadays because knowledge is more universally disseminated instead of being confined to the heads of a few, and that the multitude of educated people compensate for the rarity of learned people. But knowledge is not like riches, which, whether divided or accumulated, always make the same total. In a country where everyone knows a little, the total knowledge is small, because knowledge begets knowledge, but will not bear dispersion. For superficial instruction cannot indeed be divided amongst many, though it may be common to many unlearned men. Genuine knowledge belongs only to the learned, and depth in knowledge to the few that are very learned. And, with rare exceptions, only the man who is very learned and possessed of an immense fund of knowledge, is able to add materially to the sum of human science. Now, in the present time, it is daily more difficult to discover a really learned man, save perhaps in Germany, where science is not yet dethroned. I utter these reflections simply for the sake of a little talk and philosophizing, not because I doubt for a single moment the truth of what you say. Indeed, were I to see the world quite full of ignorant impostors on the one hand and presumptuous fools on the other, I should still hold to my present belief that knowledge and enlightenment are on the increase. Friend, of course then you believe that the century is superior to all the preceding ones? Tristano, decidedly. All the centuries have had this opinion of themselves, even those of the most barbarous ages. The present century thinks so, and I agree with it. But if you ask me in what is it superior to the others, and whether in things pertaining to the body or the mind, I should refer you to what I said just now on the subject of progress. Friend, in short, to sum it up in two words, do you agree with what the journals say about nature and human destiny? We are not now talking of literature or politics on which subjects their opinion is indisputable. Tristano. Precisely. I bow before the profound philosophy of the journals, which will in time supersede every other branch of literature and every serious and exacting study. The journals are guides and lights of the present age, is that not so? Friend, very true, unless you are speaking ironically. You have become one of us. Tristana, yes, certainly I have. Friend, then what shall you do with your book? Will you allow it to go down to posterity, conveying doctrines so contrary to the opinions you now hold? Tristana, to posterity? Permit me to laugh, since you are no doubt joking. If I thought otherwise, I should laugh all the more. For it is not a personal matter, but one relating to the individuals and individual things of the 19th century, 
about whom and which there is no fear of the judgment of posterity, since they will know no more about the matter than their ancestors knew. Quote, individuals are eclipsed in the crowd, unquote, as our modern thinkers elegantly say, which means that the individual need not put himself to any inconvenience, because whatever his merit, he can neither hope for the miserable reward of glory in reality nor in his dreams. Leave, therefore, the masses to themselves, although I would ask the wiseacres who illuminate the world in the present day to explain how the masses can do anything without the help of the individuals that compose them. But to return to my book and posterity. Books now are generally written in less time than is necessary for reading them. Their worth is proportioned to their cost and their longevity to their value. It is my opinion that the 20th century will make a very clean sweep of the immense bibliography of the 19th. Perhaps, however, it will say something to this effect. Quote, we have here whole libraries of books which have cost some 20, some 30 years of labor and some less, but all have required very great exertion. Let us read these first because it is probable there is much to be learnt from them. These, at an end, we will pass to lighter literature." Unquote. My friend, this is a puerile age, and the few men remaining are obliged to hide themselves for very shame, resembling as they do a well-formed man in a land of cripples. And these good youths of the century are desirous of doing all that their ancestors did. Like children, they wish to act on the spur of the moment without any laborious preparation. They would like the progress of the age to be such as to exempt them and their successors from all fatiguing study and application in the acquirement of knowledge. For instance, a commercial friend of mine told me the other day that even mediocrity has become very rare. Scarcely anyone is fit to fulfill properly the duty which devolves upon him, either by necessity or choice. This seems to me to mark the true distinction between this century and the preceding ones. At all times, greatness has been rare. But in former centuries, mediocrity prevailed, whereas in our century, nullity prevails. All people wish to be everything. Hence, there is such confusion and riot that no attention is paid to the few great men who are still to be found and who are unable to force a way through the vast multitude of rivals. Thus, whilst the lowest people believe themselves illustrious, obscurity and success in nothing is the common fate both of the highest and lowest. But long live statistics, long live the sciences, economical, moral, and political, the pocket encyclopedias, the manuals of everything, and all the other fine creations of our age. And may the 19th century live forever, for though poor in results, it is yet very rich and great in promise, which is well known to be the best of signs. Let us therefore console ourselves that for 66 more years, this admirable century will have the talking to itself, and will be able to utter its own opinions. Friend, you speak, it seems, somewhat ironically, but you ought at least to remember that this is a century of transition. Tristano, what do you infer from that? All centuries have been and will be more or less transitional, because human society is never stationary and will never at any time attain to a fixed condition. It follows, therefore, that this fine word is either no excuse for the 19th century or is one common to all the centuries. It remains to be seen whether the transition now in progress is from good to better or from bad to worse. But perhaps you mean to say that the present age is especially transitional inasmuch as it is a rapid passage from one state of civilization to another absolutely different, in which case I would ask your permission to laugh at this rapidity. Every transition requires a certain amount of time, and when too rapidly accomplished, 
invariably relapses, and the progress has to recommence from the very beginning. Thus it has always been, for nature does not advance by leaps, and when forced, no durable result is obtained. In short, precipitous transitions are only apparent transitions and do not represent genuine progress. Friend, I advise you not to talk in this fashion with everyone, because if you do, you will gain many enemies. Tristano, what does it matter? Henceforth, neither enemies nor friends can do me much harm. Friend, very probably you will be despised as one incapable of comprehending the spirit of modern philosophy and who cares little for the progress of civilization and the sciences. Tristano, I should be very sorry for that, but what can I do? If I am despised, I will endeavor to console myself. Friend, but have you or have you not changed your opinions? And what is to be done about your book? Tristano, it would be best to burn it. If it be not burnt, it may be preserved as a book full of poetic dreams, inventions, and melancholy caprices. Or better, as an expression of the unhappiness of the writer. Because I will tell you in confidence, my dear friend, that I believe you and everyone else to be happy. As for myself, however, with your permission, and that of the century, I am very unhappy and all the journals of both worlds cannot persuade me to the contrary. Friend, I do not know the cause of this unhappiness of which you speak, but a man is the best judge of his own happiness or unhappiness, and his opinion cannot be wrong. Tristano, very true, and more, I tell you frankly, that I do not submit to my unhappiness, nor bow the head and come to terms with destiny like other men. I ardently wish for death above everything, with such warmth and sincerity as I firmly believe few have desired it. I would not speak to you thus if I were not sure that when the time came, I should not belie my words. I may add that, although I do not yet foresee the end of my life, I have an inward feeling that almost assures me the hour of which I speak is not far distant. I am more than ripe for death, and it seems to me too absurd and improbable that being dead spiritually as I am, and the tale of my life being told in every part, I should linger out the forty or fifty years with which nature threatens me. I am terrified at the mere thought of such a thing, but like all evils that exceed the power of imagination, this seems to me a dream, an illusion devoid of truth, so that if anyone speaks to me about the distant future, as though I were to have a part in it, I cannot help smiling to myself, so sure am I that I have not long to live. This thought, I may say, alone supports me. Books and studies, which I often wonder I ever loved, great designs and hopes of glory and immortality, are things now undeserving of even a smile. Nor do I now laugh at the projects and hopes of this century. I cordially wish them every possible success, and I praise, admire, and sincerely honor their good intentions. But I do not envy posterity, nor those who still have a long life before them. Formerly, I used to envy fools, imbeciles, and people with high opinion of themselves, and I would willingly have changed my lot with any one of them. Now I envy neither fools nor the wise, the great, the small, the weak, the powerful. I envy the dead, and with them alone I would exchange my lot. Every pleasurable fancy, every thought of the future that comes to me in my solitude, and with which I pass away the time, is allied with the thought of death, from which it is inseparable. And in this longing, neither the remembrance of my childish dreams, nor the thought of having lived in vain, disturbs me any more as formerly. When death comes to me, I shall die as peacefully and contentedly as if it were the only thing for which I had ever wished in the world. 
This is the sole prospect that reconciles me to destiny. If, on the one hand, I were offered the fortune and fame of Caesar or Alexander, free from the least stain, and on the other hand, death today, I should unhesitatingly choose to die today. End of section 33. End of Essays and Dialogues by Giacomo Leopardi, translated by Charles Edwardus.